Hey guys, I uh, haven't done a video for a while. Um, it's a lack of subject matter, lack of uh, the right vibe in mind. Up there, actually last time I did a video, I talked about right where my finger's pointing. You can see Ron Carter, the beautiful, uh, wonderful coffee coffee painting um, that Diana and Germany did and sent to me. That was very kind. He's hanging up on my closet there. Incredible work. Um, I haven't done a video for a long time. Um, not been in the best of moods to do them. Don't really have anything to do it. Videos on. Um, so I was thinking of doing a, you know, what a lot of the VC members do is just videos on um, what they've been listening to. And I've been through so many stages now in the last two months of periods of listening um, very specifically to a lot of recordings by a certain artists. I should have been doing videos all along. I had this Miles Davis thing early, pre-1956 works. Listened to a lot of stuff from uh, 51 to 56 around. Um, should have done a video on that, but I didn't. So last night, um, Carm Gorvo 31 I'm pretty sure everybody that watches any of my uh, talking videos here already subscribes and sees Carm's uh, videos. And he mentioned a particularly favorite uh, drummer of mine uh, that passed away that I didn't know he had passed away. Um, Michael De Pasqua uh, died uh, August 29, 2016, at the age of 63, from cancer. He's an American drummer. Um, and actually, I'm trying to go through my, my mind because he's most closely associated with ECM Records. Um, there's not a lot of Americans that are that associated with, with ECMs um, fr from their vast um, history anyway. We've got a handful of guys like Ralph Towner, John Abercrombie, um, but there's a lot of, you know, folks like uh, Jan Garbrick, uh, Terry Ripdoll, that are not Americans that record for the label. Um, so I just found out last night through Carm's video that Mike DePasco passed away. Bummed me out even more than I was already bummed out. Um, first of all, I, I roughly knew his age, um, a few years older than me, um, and uh, didn't know he was uh, ill at all. I knew he had kind of retired from the business. Um, he was an American, and um, if you've followed the ECM history, especially in the 70s and 80s, uh, what you saw was, um, as far as drummers go, um, the number one guy who did a, a ton of, it seemed to be on everybody's album that needed a kit drummer, was John Christensen. John Christensen was m my favorite drummer. Um, kind of evolved a new style, kind of like almost like a, I don't know, like a Philly Joe Jones did or, or somebody like that in the jazz world. He, he was kind of in the jazz world, but wasn't a new style in terms of, uh, he didn't really play uh, much mainstream jazz. Jan Christensen came up with this style of using the drums instead of the real syncopated percussion, uh, you know, that drives especially small bands. He, he, Jan Christensen came up with this, with this, really the first new style of drumming that I had heard since probably what free jazz maybe had come along, um, and that is using the the drums uh, almost more orchestrally um, in. Uh, it, in setting of dynamics, there's a lot of dynamics in his in his performances, especially the more the group that that Christensen played with stretches out. Uh, the more you know, you notice this this you know very subtle um, you know dynamics getting very quiet, getting very loud. All of which, really, without keeping the basic beat in, in, in a basic way that we're used to hearing. Uh, listening to Christensen's style, which totally blew me away when I first heard it. I actually heard, I only, I've only heard two other people play. I'm sure there's other people that do and can play in that style. But I have to tell you, the only people I've really heard play it, um, you know, to any extent um, and use it quite a bit was Jack DeJanette, 
who I actually heard play in that style first. But Dijonet plays in a lot of different drum styles, even even, even plays funk, you know. He, he does the backbeat thing, and he played with Miles Davis uh, on Bitches Brew, and that was a very he heavy rhythmic album. Um, so Dijonet plays in a lot of different styles. Um, and this Jan Christensen style of... Uh, the one thing he had in common with mainstream drummers is that he played the beat largely on the cymbals, like a Philly Joe Jones, a Jimmy Cobb, those, those people from that era, um, and then used the drum kit for uh, accents, accentuation. But Christensen did it in, in probably a more dynamic way and, and maybe in, in a way in a less rhythmic way. Um, on occasion, you would hear him play a fairly straight beat, but, but that was kind of the exception. And I heard Jack Dijonet play in that style, especially in the late 70s, Dijonet played in that style. But the only guy that I really heard play extensively uh, in that style and pick up on it, like a, like a John Christensen did, was Mike DePasqua, an, an American. I don't know where he came from, you know, in terms of um, how he, he got really associated with, with the groups and the musicians that he played with. I did get to see him play live once. Um, and, um, well, let me see, out of, out of, uh, you know what, I don't think, I, I still haven't seen uh, Jack Dijonet play live, and he lives in, in New York, so he's not too far from me, so that, uh, I still stand a good chance of seeing that. Um, haven't seen John Christensen live yet either, so of, of the three guys that play in that, in that kind of style, that very dynamic style, um, that orchestrally dynamic style, as I call it, uh, the Pasqua is the only one that I did get to see live. And um, Guy blew me away live. What, what can I say? I'm very sad. I'm very down that, that he passed away. Um, thought I'd show my stuff. I'm going to try to remember to um, include links. Um, there's a Wikipedia page that's kind of incomplete. Um, and um, there's a, also an online o obituary from him. I think he was living in Florida at the time. Now, the earliest recording that I have by him, not that there's others, I'm just showing stuff that I was able to grab within like 20 minutes or so. Carm just showed this out. Oh, I should take this out of the case here. Carm just showed this uh, on vinyl. Uh, this was recorded in 77 as this very interesting group, Double Image. Uh, this is an Enja CD. Um, really, really nice uh, album. Unique band. Um, David Friedman and Dave Samuels um, both playing uh, vibraphones and marimbas, which was kind of the core of the group. Uh, Harvey Swartz on up upright bass, and Harvey went on to record some nice solo albums of his own, and Mike DePasqua on percussion. So here's their uh, untitled album. I, I, it must have been their first album. Uh, recorded in June of 1977, uh, within probably like two weeks of when I graduated high school, actually. Um, so that, that date always sticks out in my head. Um, and um, now, Double Image recorded a, a bunch more albums as a duo, just just with the Dave Friedman and Dave Samuels. Um, you know, no, no rhythm section. Um, from, you know, they're good, uh, but um, I really like the quartet with Harvey Schwartz and Mike DePasqua on drums. So, so this is the first thing. And, you know, already his style was, was there, um, already established. A lot of dynamics, a lot of qu quiet moments. Um, you know, he's not one of these guys that, oh, let me just find a groove and bash it to death until you're tired of, of hearing it. And, and, and in a lot of ways, that makes these recordings for me uh, much more enjoyable, and I probably listen to them more than if these pieces had this kind of static groove that when you first hear it, you lock into the groove and you're like, oh yeah, that grooves you know, really nicely. But then, you know, after X number of listens, you grow tired of it, and then you find yourself not revisiting it. You know, well, well you know, with, with his albums, you know, all of which were done with small groups, um, you know, you can... It's just as interesting to really hone in on the percussion and drums as it is any of the other instruments, because the drums are always doing something different. Um, you know, they're always 
you know, getting down, getting quiet, playing this part of the kit, you know, uh, you know, getting more dynamic and the band, you know, responding to him and him responding to the band. So this, this first double image is the, um, oldest thing I have in terms of when it was recorded. Uh, he recorded one other with double image, which, uh, is an ECM album. The first one was an Enja album. They, they recorded, um, this one album for ECM in October 78, um, which was the following year. Same lineup, Harvey Swartz on bass, uh, Dave Samuels, David Friedman on uh, vibraphones and marimbas, and Mike DePasco on drums. And um, sad, uh, this is what's playing in the background, just not to keep you waiting with bated breath, Double Image Dawn. This is probably the most beat up ECM I have, as far as the vinyls that have not been released on the CD. Um, see Mike DePasqua is the guy the white shirt the thick black hair um, another good album uh, another one that ECM needs to re-release on CD which they haven't sorry for the glare guys I have the window it's actually daytime I don't I don't do too many videos in the daytime um, but it's the daytime if I didn't do this now I probably wouldn't do it that's why that's why I'm filming now um, so dawn is one of those you know did I have I put this up on my page for folks to listen to. I have this credo that I follow. I'll only put up recordings that are out of print, and this is most certainly out of print. If I haven't put this up, I will. I, I will get to it. Um, nice album, you know. Playing in the background. Kind of an offshoot band from Double Image. In 81, um, Dave Samuels, who was one of the vibraphone players in Double Image, um, formed another group called Gallery, which also recorded one album and one album only for ECM, which is out of print, another vinyl that never came out on, um, on CD yet, which I have put up here on my page. And um, he brought Mike DePasqua along, so he kind of had half of double image here, um, but added uh, another three musicians to the band, uh, Ratso Harris on Upright Bass, um, David Darling on cello, who, you know, if you follow ECM, you know David Darling, and Paul McCandless from Oregon on um, saxophones, oboe, English horn. Very interesting, very chamberish group. When this came out, I thought, wow, this is just a real typically good ECM album. Um, and it really very much has the ECM um, aesthetic that they're known for, even though all the recordings don't really follow, but it's a very, very much of a, 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 of a chamber Euro jazz uh, thing, you know, a lot of quiet moments. Um, and I was always surprised that this didn't get re-released on, on CD. Again, Michael DePasqua. This is from uh, 81. Kind of an offshoot of, the, of a double image there. Uh, Mike DePasqua also, I don't know how he, you know, I wish I knew how he came into the um, range of some of the other ECM musicians that he played with. Um, he recorded one album, an interesting album, too, um, with, with Ralph Towner, Old Friends, New Friends. Sorry again for the glare, guys. Um, another interesting band, uh, David Darling on cello. Again, just like the Gallery album. Um, this is from July 79, so actually predate, this predates the Gallery album. Kenny Wheeler, the late great Kenny Wheeler, trumpet flugelhorn. Mike DePasqua, percussion. Eddie Gomez on bass. And Ralph Towner keyboards, guitars, and French horn. I love those albums where uh, Towner pulls out the French horn and plays a little bit. Uh, he uses it very sparingly, but but whenever he or Towner uses the French horn, it's always so effective. He, he did a bit on, on Winter Light, the Oregon album from the mid-70s, early 70s. Um, it's on the very first track. I forget the title of it. And it's just a few notes on French horn, and it's just so effective. But so um, here's Mike DePasqua. I wish he had recorded with Ralph Moore. I think they're a good... Uh, Mike DePasqua does a lot of sensitive, quiet playing. And when you're essentially an acoustic musician like Towner, um, you know, you you need that. You know, that it works well. So I kind of... I'm sad that he, he didn't get to record more with Towner. I don't know if he toured, if he got to tour with Towner. Um... 
again, I don't know how really um, Eberhard Weber became aware of Mike DePaspa. Um, you know, you never know. I, I've seen some odd combinations of ECM musicians touring with non-ECM musicians that I was not aware of these people even knew each other. So there's a lot of undocumented stuff out there. I'm an Eberhard Weber nut. I could be wrong, but I swear that I saw that at one point Eberhard Weber had done a tour and played live in a band with Mike Maneri, the vibraphone player uh, from Steps Ahead from New York City. And I don't know, uh, until I read that, I don't know how those two would know each other at all or how that came to be. Um, and there was no recorded document of them playing together. Um, however, somehow, I mean, it could even be through recommendation of um, Manfred Eicher, Man, I'm sorry for that glare again. Later that evening, Eberhard Weber uh, recorded in March of 82, uh, Mike DePasqua played and toured. I know he toured with Eberhard Weber during this period. This was a hell of a band, too. Um, and again, Paul McCandless is on here just like he was on the Gallery album. So uh, I don't know if Paul McCandless may have recommended Mike DePasqua to Eberhard Weber, or, or maybe Eberhard Weber just her double image or gallery or whatever. Uh, Bill Frizzell on guitars here and Lyle Mays from the Pat Metheny group. They did, these guys did a tour together as well. Um, there's a bootleg out there with the same exact lineup and they had an added percussionist, which live, uh, I want to say was maybe a little bit of an overkill. And then when they went to record the album, they, they dropped the percussionist, which I think was a good idea. A lot of people really, I love the cover. Um, Ebhard Weber's late wife did fantastic covers, including one for Bill Frizzell's first solo album, and I, and I love this one. I just love her cover so much. She passed away a number of years ago. Um, so here's, uh, did I show this? You know, I'm getting, I'm, I'm old, I'm senile. There's Mike DePasqua all the way on the left with his big thick, I had that head of black, dark black thick hair and the beard. And um, he's the only one in that group that's passed away right now. Um, so a lot of people really dig this album. I don't, um, I, I listen to it more for the players, what the players are doing on an individual tune. I don't think this is one of Hard Weber's best albums. A lot of people do, so what do I know? Um, and uh, Jan Garber group. Uh, did an album in recorded in December '81 with Jan Christensen on drums, and at, in the in the late '70s and early '80s, Jan Christensen seemed to be the drummer on every ECM album. I don't know how he had the time because I'm assuming he was touring as well, and he was also part of Keith Jarrett's band at the time. Um, and just at the point that it seemed like you couldn't possibly have Jan Christensen play on any more albums. It seemed like ECM started and he was, Jan Christensen was kind of the unofficial house drummer um, for ECM. It seems like, um, you know, ECM needed to find somebody else because Jan Christensen only has four limbs and can only be in one place at one time. And this is where Mike DePasqua kind of came in and started all of a sudden playing on albums um, and with people that, that, that in prior conglomerations had Jan Christensen on drums like uh, Ralph Towner had previously used Jan Christensen. Jan Garbrick recorded Paths and Prince, uh, an album I like very much, uh, in a quartet with Jan Christensen on drums in December 1981 and toured behind the group in 82. And by the time the tour um, started. Now the album, you know, usually takes what, back then it used to take like about eight months for an album on ECM from the time it was recorded to the time it was out in the shops. Um, and so they did a tour after the Pads and Prince album was released, which had Jan Christensen on drums, uh, Eberhard Weber on bass, and uh, Bill Frizzell on guitar. And um, John Christensen did not tour behind that album. And this is where Mike DePasqua actually became the drummer for the Jan Garbrick group, which was a quartet at that time, and stayed for, for two albums. So um, I went to, the only time I saw Mike live, Mike DePasqua live, was uh, with this Jan Garbrick quartet with Ebhard Weber and Bill Frizzell. 
I went there expecting to see uh, Jan Christensen on drums, but there was Mike DePosqua, and I knew Mike DePosqua from his earlier albums anyway. Uh, but then, you know, back then you didn't have the internet to find out all the details. So I was surprised to see Mike DePosqua playing there. Um, to this day, I wish there was a recording of that. He played one of the most amazing drum solos I've ever heard, and it's not amazing from a technical standpoint where, you, you know, most most drum solos that people scream and shout, oh, you got to hear this, are people that maybe understand a little bit about drum technique or something. Um, and um, they're speaking more from a technical point of view than, than, than the musical one. Uh, Mike DePosco played, you know, what I would consider one of the most musical drum solos I've ever heard, in that it wasn't a, let me just get loud and loud and louder and louder and louder and faster and faster till everybody's like, oh, wow, you know? Um, it was very musical, like a composition. And I forget, he had something on his drum kit, and I can't recall now, because this, this is 1982. Um, I don't know if he had a zither or auto harp or, or something, but during a drum solo, occasionally he would hit a chord on this thing. It wasn't a synthesizer of any type. And his, his, his drum solo wasn't what you expect for a drum solo with a lot of dynamics. It was like a composition. Um, and it, it just blew me away. I really wish I, I, even on a bootleg, I had that on tape. Luckily, after the concert, the only time I ever got to speak to him, I got to speak to, to Mike after the concert, um, because thankfully the club didn't push everybody out as soon as the band was done performing. And the musicians in the band um, came out. And um, actually, the only, one I, the only one I really remember talking to or really seeing was Mike DePosqua came out. I got to speak to him and I, and I got to tell him what a fantastic drum solo I thought that was how unique and everything. And he, I wouldn't say he blew it off. He's a very, very, very nice guy. Um, but he was like, oh, yeah, thanks. Yeah, you know, it wasn't like um, there was no ego. Was like, and, I, and I always wanted to say to him, you don't understand, you know. You've seen what most people do on drum solos, and it's a show-offy thing. And this was more like a composition for live solo drums and little percussion things. Um, absolutely wonderful, wonderful, and, and I just wish there would have been a, some kind of live document from that. Um, and he also told me um, about an al another album he had recorded, um, because, you know, at that point, the albums I showed were all that I'm aware of that he had out. And he said, yeah, I recorded a, an album, I don't even know, uh, I believe he's a German musician. I couldn't remember the guy's name. He said, oh yeah, I just recorded an album, uh, you know, that's coming out on, on ECM. I think this actually, yeah, ECM. Which, um, he told me the guy's name and I didn't remember it. And I'm like, I'm never gonna find this out, but I really wanted to hear it. And I don't know how I found it. it a year or more later, I found it. And it was this album, which I've put up on my site because it's another, ECM that's out of print, never released in this country, by the way. I had to buy this as an import, uh, I think a German import. Um, I guess ECM thought Adelhard Reutinger was not a name that would sell a lot of records in America since nobody knew who he was. And I got this as an import. Love this album. Another ECM. I have this up on my page somewhere. That has not been uh, re-released on CD. Fantastic album. This is a, what, one, two, three, four, seven piece band. So this is the largest band that the Pasqua recorded with, um, that I'm aware of anyway. Um, you know, uh, Adelhard Roding is a bass player. This is a great album. Uh, but there's a saxophone, piano, uh, guitar, vibraphone, uh, voice by um, Ina Kemenas from America, the only other American musician on here, and Mike on, on, on percussion. It's a wonderful album. Music is a bit like the cover, quite a bit like the cover. Love this album. Don't know how I ever found this because I, I had to go. I didn't know the guy's name. I didn't remember the name of the guy that he gave me. And, you know, I just used to go through the import sections A to Z, you know, be in the store for six hours. And I came across this and I don't know what I noticed first about it. You know, was it the cover? You know, the musicians' names are up there in the corner or the fact that it was an ECM. 
best seven ninety nine I ever spent. Um, I can't believe this hasn't come out on, on CD. But I was really thrilled. And as soon as I saw this, I'm like, this is the album Mike told me about. Um, so uh, Mike recorded with Jan Garbrick right after that tour, supporting the Jan Garbrick uh, Paths and Prince album that um, John Christensen had played drums on. And March 1983, which was, uh, I want to say probably a little bit after when I saw, I can't remember exactly when I saw them. It would have been late 82, possibly early 83. Um, so here's a Jan Garbrick group, uh, Wayfarer album, um, which is the exact lineup that I actually saw play live with Mike DePasqua on drums, Bill Frizzell on guitar, Eberhard Weber on bass, Jan Garbrick on saxophones. Um, this one is not one of my favorites. As much as I love uh, Eberhard's playing on it, uh, Mike DePasqua's playing on it, Bill Frizzell oddly enough for this album, gets a little carried away from me with the distortion. Um, not, it's not horrible, but it's definitely not ranking among my favorite Jan Garbrick albums. One that I like a lot better is the is the next one that came out, which Mike DePospel was still in, in Jan Garbrick's group playing. Hope the music's not too loud in the background. I'm turning it down a little bit. See dynamics. This is this is you know dynamics. Sometimes it gets loud. Sometimes it gets quiet. Jan Garbrick group. It's okay to listen to the gray voice. I really dig this out. I love this album. Um, a real return to form. This and Paths and Prince, uh, my two favorite kind of quartet Garbrick albums. Again with Eberhard Weber on bass and Jan Garbrick on um, saxophones. The great Mike DePasqua on drums and percussion. I really love this album. Uh, and David Torn in uh, re replacing Bill Frizzell. Uh, David Torn is not known for playing quiet guitar. This is not only my favorite playing that I've ever heard from David Torn, and I've got him in other groups, and I've got a bunch of solo albums of his, and I've got him playing in the Everyman Band. This is still my favorite playing by him. Maybe it's because it's him at his most restrained. Honestly, for me, David Torn gets way carried away when he when he's solo, you know, on a lot of his, actually, not as much on his ECM albums. He's got some other solo albums that are just, whew, they're out there. Uh, they're out there and loud and noisy and, and not really my thing. Um, I do listen to them, though, oddly enough, um, you know, but, but I usually I always come away with the, gee, I wish he would have toned it down a little bit. But for some reason, he was much more subdued in this album. I highly recommend this one. A little avant-garde like Jan Garbrick gets, um, but just really, it's, it's quite a short, one of the shortest Jan Garbrick albums, probably his shortest group album ever. Uh, but I really like the atmosphere of it. Um, David Torn actually plays some guitar synthesizer on here and DX7 keyboard. And, the, and that's, there's some nice textures that aren't on the other, the two previous uh, Jan Garbrick group albums because there's no keyboards on them. On here, there's, there's some synthesizer, uh, guitar synthesizer and keyboard synthesizer that really creates, you know, a nice backdrop for the other guys, the bass drums and especially the sax to play over. Really, really love this album. Um, and um, after that, what happened? You know, just as Mike DePosco seemed to be getting all these gigs that um, John Christensen used to get, because uh, Christensen was doing tours as well, I guess. Um, then all of a sudden he disappeared. And it was years and years. I'm like, where is this guy? What's going on? Uh, um, and, and it was many, many years later, after not hearing anything from him at all, that I found an article. And I believe it was actually an interview with him. Um, but it could have been somebody else speaking on his behalf, like another musician he played with. Um, who bas where, where basically Mike DePasqua said that he was doing a lot of, uh, you know, tours, and not just, I like it, you know, pretty much all those albums that you saw he toured behind. So you know, there's a lot more touring than probably studio recording going on. And most of, you know, this kind of music, this is a mainstream jazz, so it's not really that popular in the U.S., or in English-speaking countries. And so most of 
the touring um, is done overseas in foreign countries in Europe, whatever. And I recall this interview, which I wish I could find again, but I don't even know if I read it online. Um, this is how long ago it was. Um, that basically said uh, Mike DePasco could only speak English. And, you know, and even though his, the bands that he played with, um, all those members could speak English, even though they weren't Americans for the most part. Um, he said it was kind of getting him a bit depressed because most of the touring traveling was outside of English speaking countries and he started feeling very isolated uh, being in places where he didn't speak the language so the only time he really got to speak to anybody that spoke English was whatever time he spent with the, the guys that were in the band like an Eberhard Weber and Jan Garbrick and people like that that I know speak English um, and he said that started to kind of get to him and make him feel isolated which was one of the reasons why he dropped out of music which is just such a shame um, but I guess he wasn't doing much touring in you know, the English-speaking countries because this music is not popular there, so you tour where the demand is. Um, so I never forgot that. Then many years later, reading uh, a, an article with Ebard Weber, who spoke about Mike DePasqua. And Mike DePasqua seemed to become Ebard Weber's preferred drummer, actually. Uh, Ebhard Weber also stated that, I don't, I think, I think Mike DePasqua's father had either passed away or was ill, or whatever, but his father actually owned um, several Subway sandwich shops, maybe more than a few, and always wanted Mike to get into that business. Um, I don't know if it's when his father passed along that Mike inherited the business, which pretty much put him in that mode um, to, you know, be a manager for these, you know, for the, for the chain that they owned. Um, or the number of stores in the chain that they owned, um, or, you know, exactly how the events fell into place. But, um, you know, apparently he had work, and I'm pretty sure this was in Florida. And Mike kind of just eased into that, kind of became big deal executive. You see, if you read his obituary, it goes into the, it goes into that a bit with the Subway sandwich shop chain things. And it kind of made him, you know, he had a way to earn a living didn't have to leave the country kind of thing. Um, he's very modest about his talent. And in a late interview that I did read, a very brief one, Mike said, you know, the world doesn't really need me to come back and play drums because there's so many great drummers out there. And I'm like, whoa, <laughs> you know? And, you know, I'm, I'm so sorry he passed on because I'm every time I even thought about him or played something by him, I always thought, one of these days, I'm going to get this guy's email address. I'm going to tell him how wonderful I think he is and also how he's wrong about the world doesn't need me because there's so many great technical drummers out there. Because that's not that's not what he was about, you know? It's not that he wasn't good technically. It's that, you know, like Thelonious Monk or somebody, you know, he had an approach that very few people had that very few people could do or know how to do. You have to listen to music, know what kind of where it's going before it gets there when you're improvising. And unless you're just going to sit and ride a groove, you've got to react and know when you should be reacting to the musicians and when you should maybe lead them somewhere, which he did in dynamics. You know, when it's okay to be really quiet, maybe even when the other guys are loud, you know, it, it's just an absolute master of that. And, you know, besides John Christensen and, and um, you know, Jack DeJanet at times, I can't compare him to any other drummer. And, um, you know, wow, I'm just, I'm so bummed that he's passed away. But he had left the music scene, I guess by the mid 80s, it seems, he kind of dropped off the radar after uh, like, you know, late 83, 84. Um, and I don't know if that's when his dad passed away or when he just, you know, made a decision, look, I'm just going to go do this job because I, I don't want to tour in foreign countries anymore. Didn't hear from him again for ages. And then after a, a long, long, long period of not making solo albums, bassist, composer, band leader, Eberhard Weber had not done a solo album for a lot of years, his longest gaff ever, actually. And in, um, I don't know if it was two, 
the date on here is 2001, but I don't know if the sessions were from 2000. I should have looked. Abhard Weber came out with his first solo album in a, in a number of years called Endless Days. And he gathered a band of people not unknown to Eberhard Weber albums. Uh, Rainier Bruninghaus on, on keyboards, who played with Eberhard Weber since the 70s, very long association. And uh, Paul McCandless, who had played with Eberhard Weber in the Later That Evening album that I showed. And uh, Eberhard Weber contacted Mike DePasqua and asked him to come out of retirement to play on his album. That's how much Eberhard Weber thought of him. Now think of this. Mike DePosco had probably not played drums for 15 years at that point. Um, so he had to get his chops up. Now, Eberhard Weber was obviously very well aware that DePosco had kind of dropped out of the, of the scene. And yet, he must have, you know, really done a good job to convince DePosco to play because I'm sure you know, Mike's initial reaction was, well, you know, I kind of retired. I haven't played for X number of years. And yet Eberhard Weber, who's played with the greats, um, wanted him so much that he was like, no, 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 I really want you. I really want you. And it was just wonderful. When I, I was almost as excited that there was a new Eberhard Weber solo album after this long gap of no solo albums, um, as I was equally thrilled that Mike DePasqua returned you know, to the recording scene and playing scene again with this wonderful record, Endless Days. Very much a nice chamber jazz recording. You know, it's a quartet band, you know, with horn, piano, uh, bass and drums, but it, it's, you know, these are, the pieces are all fairly short and they're, um, there's some improvisation, but it's a lot of written out stuff. Uh, the most written out album that Everhard ever did for many, many, many years. Um, nice, nice album. And that was it. I don't know about a tour behind that album, whether it happened. I don't, I kind of doubt that if it did happen, Mike DePasqua would have played on the tour. Um, he probably, he probably did it more as a favor. It's wonderful to hear his drums again, though. Um, probably did it more as a favor to Eberhard Weber than an ongoing thing, you know, and I don't, I don't, I've got a feeling Empire Weber did not tour behind that album. He was a part of Jan Garbrick's group at that time and still always, always toured on every Jan Garbrick tour from that period. So I think after that album was recorded, you know, Weber probably just went back on tour with Garbrick. So I don't, I don't, I don't know that there was a tour behind that. With one exception, that was all we heard from Mike the Paspa until after Ebhard Weber had his stroke a number of years later. Actually, a few years later. And, um, you know, when it looked like Ebhard Weber was never going to record again, he got the concept of going through um, many, many hours of tapes of solo bass improvisations that Ebhard Weber had done while he was on tour with Jan Garbrick, cut out those solo bass improvisations and cut out the sections that were interesting uh, in them and kind of rebuild them into little pieces um, and put them out as individual little compositions. And Eberhard Weber only has limited use in one hand and the other hand is fine, was recording some additional uh, keyboard textures on top of these bass things and sometimes calling in other musicians to add little parts, sometimes leaving them as they were, sometimes to be a little solo bass thing with looping and all that, that, that Eberhard Weber was doing live, and that would be enough of a composition there. And uh, other times he would bring in, um, like Jan Garbrick, for instance, to play some, some saxophone um, or flute on a track um, that he had kind of created out of these bass solos. Um, also had a trumpeter on a later album come. But um, he called up Mike DePasqua after his stroke and explained to Mike DePasqua that he was doing this, um, you know, album where he's editing and, and, and creating pieces out of his solo um, bass explorations. And he would like Mike DePasqua to come down and play percussion on a couple of tracks. And again, right after the, the, the previous Eberhard Weber album, which was done around 2001, Mike DePasqua put the drums down. 
and being the kind of guy I guess he was, Mike DePasqua flew out to France, uh, apparently, and sat down with Ebhard Weber and discussed what pieces he wanted drums on and overdubbed his, his percussion parts. I believe this is the last time we heard him play. And um, so 2012, I think it is 2012. Let's get this out of the way. Pretty sure it's 2012. Um, this resume album came out by Everhard Weber, which has Mike DePosco playing only on a couple tracks. Um, certainly worth hearing, though. And I believe these are Mike's last uh, playing contributions uh, ever. But it goes to show you, I guess, the kind of person Mike was that, again, he had put down drums and decided, I'm not going to play anymore. Everhard Weber, please, please, you know. And think of all the great percussionists that would jump at the chance to, to do this with Everhard Weber, and yet Weber thought highly enough of DePasqua that that's who he wanted uh, to come and, and, and create these percussion parts over these pre-existing uh, bass solo things. Um, so Mike apparently flew out, you know, to France, uh, south of France, which uh, is where Everhard Weber lives and um, sat and I guess discussed what pieces needed drums, then went to the studio and recorded the drum pieces, and then that was it. Now this was probably done in probably 2011, I'm guessing. Um, and, and since Mike had cancer, I don't know how long in advance he was diagnosed. I don't know if you know Mike was aware that he had cancer at, at this point, that he had gone out to work on these and was already, you know, maybe thinking of his mortality or whatever, even though he was not even 60 at the, at, at that time, um, you know, or whether he just did this out of, out of friendship. But, um, I think it speaks to probably the kind of person that Mike DePasqua was. Um, so I guess it's kind of fitting because, you know, in, in a way this is hopefully not the last we'll hear from Eberhard Weber, but you know, it certainly suggests that, yeah, he may not be doing much more recording. Um, and, you know, not knowing that Mike DePosco was ill, I was always hoping to hear more from him. But I'm glad that, you know, he went out and he did this with Emhard Weber, who knew how special Mike DePosco was, obviously, because he, he must have had a hell of a job convincing him to come out of retirement to record on two occasions, um, you know, years apart. Um, so that's my Mike DePasqua, RIP buddy. I, I got to see him live once. Seemed like a wonderful person. And um, bummed and sorry to see him go. And this is a long, 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 long talk. Um, so I was going to show some other stuff, but I'm not going to because the, the video is too long. Got a couple links. I'll link the, uh, the, 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 the Wikipedia page, which is incomplete. As far as uh, Mike DePasqua's um, little, I wouldn't say biography, it's not even a biography. And um, his obituary notice, too, which is uh, has more details on him, actually, than the Wikipedia page. And that's it. You've been listening to Mike DePasqua in uh, Double Image. R.I.P., buddy. Um, another one, another, another great, another great underappreciated it seems, um, and certainly unique and, and, and one of only a few, one of only a few that seem to be able to really absorb and understand and play in that style. So, um, you know, I guess hopefully he'll live in the, you know, in these recordings, some of which are out of print, but, but you know, there's still the on Garbrick things are in print and, um, you know, hopefully those things that are out of print that only came out on vinyl, that he appears on um, will come out, you know, eventually, you know, in whatever format, you know, downloads or CDs or whatever. Okay, guys, this is my first video in a long time and my first ramble in, in a long time. So thanks for watching. Hope everybody's well. I'll talk about myself and uh, other, other things too, um, you know, next time around. I, I, I won't wait two more months to do another video. So for now, I'm signing off and um, I'll see you next time.